Hi, everybody. <clears throat> uh, I want to welcome everyone to our panel discussion today uh, featuring uh, three of our distinguished black alumni from the School of Architecture at Georgia Tech, uh, along with one of our current students. Uh, I'm Scott Marble. Uh, I'm the chair of the School of Architecture. And, um, and this morning, we will hear from Chelsea Davis, uh, Ralph Raymond, Bill Stanley, and Sydney Henry. Uh, who will discuss their work uh, and uh, what they're doing, what they have been doing since they uh, graduated from Georgia Tech and the work they've been doing at their respective firms. Um, and then Sydney will talk a little bit about life as a black student in architecture school today. Um, and they will share their insights on how uh, the current environment has impacted, um, how they see the profession today, uh, and more importantly, uh, I think how this moment in history uh, has the potential to change, to change the future of the architecture profession and the educational system that prepares students uh, to become future architects. Um, the discussion will be moderated by our NOMAS uh, student organization. And I have to always, I can't never say enough about, um, uh, about NOMAS. And, uh, how important they've been to the school and the role that they've played in the school, certainly since I've been here in the past six years as chair. Um, they organize events, they, they organize lectures uh, that bring the entire student body together uh, to provide really invaluable opportunities uh, for students of color to learn and assume leadership skills. I, I really feel like that's one of the most important things that NOMAS does is it puts students in a position to be leaders and to think about how they can lead when they leave school. Um, and they work very collaboratively with, with the other four student organizations to really enhance the educational experience at Georgia Tech. Um, so again, great job, um, everybody that's part of NOMAS. So before I hand it over to, to them to introduce the panelists, I do also want to acknowledge uh, the behind the scenes work um, of Nitra Wisdom. Uh, Nitra is really, was key in making this event happen. Uh, Nitra, uh, as all of you know, is one of our academic advisors. Um, and in addition to help organizing this event, She's really been playing an incredibly important and active role in the school um, as a member of our equity, justice, and inclusion task force in the school, and also the college is the College of Designs um, uh, Diversity and Inclusion Council. Um, and I would say even more important than those specific things is just the role that she plays in the school in supporting our students. So Nitra, thank you for everything you do. Um, so I will now hand it over to Sherrod and Christian, I think, uh, who are going to introduce uh, our panelists today, and I really look forward to the discussion. Um, thank you, Scott. Um, we welcome you all to the SOA Black Alumni panel. Um, first of all, I would like to kind of just uh, let you let all know that anyone can put in questions at the Q&A as we go along with uh, with the panel, and at the end of it, we'll pick a few for uh, for our panelists. And now to introduce our panelists, uh, our first one is uh, Sydney Davis. She graduated from Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech with a uh, Master's in Architecture in 2019. Uh, she currently works at Perkins and Will, and uh, she uh, had a Bachelor of Science degree in Architectural Engineering from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University in 2017. Then we have uh, Ralph Raymond, um, who is the current president of NOMA Atlanta um, and the current treasurer for AIA Georgia and board member of the ACE Mentor Program in Atlanta. And uh, he, cur he currently works at um, Okay, he's the past recipient of the John A. Busby Jr. Young Architect Medal, and um, he participated in programs such as Discover Architecture, Project Pipeline, ACE Mentor, AIA Atlanta's High School Design Competitions, and so many uh, others. Then Sydney Henry, uh, who earned a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from Georgia Tech in May of 2019 and is a current uh, Master's of Architecture student. 
And last but ne definitely not least, we have William J. Stanley III. Um, he is the founder and principal of Stanley Love Stanley, and he is an honorary uh, fellow of AIA. And now I'll give it over to Sharad. Hello, everybody. Um, so these will be our panelists joining us today. Um, and let's just get into our um, discussion questions. Um, so first, our discussion questions is, where did your inspiration to study and or practice architecture come from? So I just want to run through the list. Um, so we'll start with um, you, Bill. Well, I can say that um, architecture was something that sort of runs in my family. My cousin Nelson Harris uh, practiced in uh, Chicago, Youngstown, and Cleveland. It was very instrumental in my uh, studying architecture. Um, the most important thing I think was that when I was a young boy, there weren't any black architects in Atlanta. <laughs> architecture was uh, was pretty much hands off uh, for black folks, and so um, he was instrumental in making sure that I studied and thought seriously about it. He was a good friend of me, Spandau, and wanted me to go to Illinois Tech, but Chicago was too cold, so I couldn't do that. So I ended up at Georgia Tech. But, you know, a, a profession that um, that I sort of always gravitated towards, I could always draw. I like Lincoln Logs. I could build things. You know, it's just one of those things that um, the Masons in my family, grand, grandfather was a, uh, great-grandfather was a bridge builder. He was a very wealthy man doing that. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's just something that, that sort of runs in, in, in my blood. Um, but architecture is a, is, is a life's work, and uh, people joke at me, why are you still practice? Well, you never get it right, so you just keep practicing and practicing until you, until you do get it right, and you get it right occasionally when you go over a nice building. Uh, so, you know, oh, and by the way, uh, I am not an honorary fellow in AIA. I'm the former chancellor of the College of Fellows of AIA. I'm an honorary fellow of the Architecture Institute of Canada, so I'm a Canadian. But, Thank you for that. All right, thank you. Uh, so next, Ralph, same question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm Ralph Raymond. Uh, nice to be on the panel. So for me, um, it might be a little simple, but it started off with really just kindergarten building blocks. I wanted to be an architect since I was five years old. Uh, and so the building blocks really started to to um, play, a, play a, 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 a way in developing my mind technically. Uh, but also, you know, I actually, you know, was born in Haiti, uh, wasn't raised there, but born in Haiti, but always had the idea to go back into impact and buildings, you know, everyone uh, inhabits a building, regardless of if it's a home, a building, an office, X, Y, Z, but really the idea to go back and to continue the infrastructure and building on, on my home country. Um, so between that and then just how, how technical um, building is, architecture is, the idea of that and how my mind works, it always just clicked since I was five years old to be an architect, and today I am that. So um, that's kind of where it started. Thank you. Um, next, Chelsea Davis. Yeah, so my inspiration isn't romantic at all. Uh, I actually, uh, funny enough, I. I started to recognize that there was a satisfaction that came from creating and shaping space by playing uh, The Sims. I would often play that game and, and not play the game, but rather just build the homes and create, create spaces for the activities to happen. And in recognizing the satisfaction I got and seeing the spaces that I created being used, um, you know, I started thinking about uh, a career in architecture or, or interior design and started looking into that more. Um, and that that curiosity grew. But I think, if anything, it, it is my curiosity that has kept inspiring me um, and keeps inspiring me, um, wanting to better understand what architecture is, what it can mean. Um, and, and getting to understand that for myself. Very nice. I actually got a similar background with the Sims also, so I relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, Sydney Henry. Hi, so 
Uh, I've wanted to be an architect since I was about nine years old. Um, I used to watch this show called Extreme Makeover Home Edition with my mom every single week. Um, she's actually on the call, so I'm going to be lame and say hi, mom. Uh, <laughs> and uh, from that young age, I told them, like, I want to do this. I want to be an architect. I want to be just like this lady on the TV screen with her pink um, tool set, but I want mine to be purple, and I just want to build homes for people. And Obviously, at nine years old, I didn't know exactly what an architect does, but I just saw how happy it was, how happy it made the people to have these new homes that were accessible or just better for their lives in a whole. Um, and that's really where it started. And my family just ran with it. Uh, I got tool sets for Christmases. I got hand saws, wood. If I wanted to go to the art supply store, I was being driven at any hour of the night. So that is really where the inspiration came from. That's great. Um, so next, our next question um, will be, um, so with the current social shift um, has moved conversations around racial justice, health disparities, climate change, and et cetera, um, from the margins to the mainstream, what trends from this shift are you seeing in your field that suggest positive and maybe long lasting changes? And are there any that give you cause for concern? So anyone that wants to jump in first. Well, I think um, the question itself kind of answers the thing the, the is the response itself that it is many hands are put it being put into the pot right now. And that's really great uh, to see all that, uh, you know, collaboration between all different races come together. Uh, and so I think we need to hold on to that and not think that it's a quick fix. Uh, so I think there are certain times, um, I guess, things trend versus being the status quo. So I think one thing that one concern that, you know, I would have personally is there's a lot of individuals who are currently uh, providing support and collaboration, um, but we don't want it to be this superficial thing. We don't want it to be this one, you know, one, you know, one, one hit or quitter, if you would, or this one time th it deal. We really want it to be lasting because the work that needs to be done is something that, that's going to take decades, not just, okay, two years worth of, you know, investment and, you know, a few dollars. You know, it's going to take decades of work uh, so that way this can be overcome. I think that's, I'll start there and let everyone else chime in. I'll jump in here. You know, we talk about societal shifts. Um, and as a child of the 50s and 60s, 70s, I grew up in the civil rights program. In fact, I'm a civil rights my favorite. The reason I came to Georgia Tech, one of the reasons was I got a, an NAACP award, scholarship $1,000 a year for the Herbert Lehman Fund. And that was because I was going to be a guinea pig to jump into this place, Lake of Fire, that nobody else had been before. And so it's in my blood to know that things come in cycles. And the more we are able to make uh, judgment calls and changes, the more power pushes back. And what we see now, uh, in Georgia and other places is the power pushing back. So the question that I always have is, how strong is it? How important is it that we take this opportunity to correct some ills that are, that are monumental ills, that are, that are generational, intergenerational ills? What can we do to make sure that gentrification doesn't snowball people out? I mean, we've got two examples in Atlanta, uh, one on Bankhead Highway um, at the uh, Quarry Yards, um, where major corporations come in and made a, a major investment in, what happens to the families around? Are we able to get parity and equity in, in what happens there? Does transportation work out? And West Side Future Fund and what happens in that in that area of town? Are we pushed to the margins? Or do we have an opportunity to really um, put a stake in the ground and start to change some things around the lives of people? And that's what this architecture business is all about, changing the lives of people. It's not about changing the, the pockets of, of wealthy people. Well, that's very important as well. I mean, I've been in Midtown for some time, and Midtown's just taken off. I mean, it's, it's huge. They're going to run me out of here and buy my building, I'll be gone. Because, you know, it's, it's a vibrant place to be. But at the same time, we have great disparities back and forth. And architecture has an opportunity, uh, if practiced correctly, to start to delve into some of these really deep, deep societal issues. What's going to happen with the infrastructure program? Is that real or is it not? How many people really want to change this nation? What are going to push this forward? And uh, it takes a couple of generations for those things to happen. Um, and uh, it's really in the hands of these other young people on this call to make it, to make it go. 
I guess I'll chime in now. Uh, I think my initial thoughts for this question kind of uh, are, are similar to what Ralph was sharing. Um, it's encouraging to see that a lot more conversations are happening and they're happening with honesty um, and truths are being able to be shared. Um, not always, but I, I think the fact that it's happening and at least in the spaces that I've been in, it's been happening authentically. And I think that's the only way that we are going to be able to understand just how wrong things have been happening, um, especially within the way that we've been structuring our built environment and how it's impacting communities. Um, and, and point blank, people are fed up and they're, they're being loud about it. And I think that is every bit of what is necessary to uh, continue to push conversations where they've been afraid to go and, you know, actually try to get to the change that we like to romanticize and dream about. Um, and having projects and, and clients that are willing to go there as well. I think that is, uh, it's super exciting. Definitely something that I'm seeing um, in the projects that I've had the opportunity to touch on. And I'm, you know, it's, it's encouraging. I definitely echo what everyone has said already. Um, now we have classes like race and space and architecture where I'm actually being able to uh, interact with the community, learn more things about the history of different buildings that I never knew about. Like I pass by these buildings every single day and wouldn't have known they had ties to the black community or ties to slave labor or anything of the sort until I took these classes. Um, we have climate change classes now that I feel like one, I probably would have never been interested in really taking an undergrad because no one ever talked about it. No one talked about how this will affect our world, the world of architecture. And now because we're having these conversations and we have these classes and these opportunities to learn from other people and learn from these classes, especially in the time of COVID, um, it was a blessing in disguise of having the ability for these people to come virtually and speakers and mentors and uh, everyone to just kind of shape our idea of these trends. Uh, whether I've seen a trend in school that is long lasting, I can't say. Um, you can always throw an elective in there every single semester or one semester and say that you did something, but whether that becomes a long lasting studio or a long lasting requirement class, that's a different story. If I yeah. jump in up one more time. I mean, I also want to add in that, you know, I think we're seeing great change coming uh, on the educational front, on the, you know, practice side. But also, I think one of the big parts is, is the policy. The policies that are already in place that we're not really talking about, we're not really making changes on. You know, as architects, yes, we have, we, we hold a lot of, you know, yield a lot of power in our pen, in our, our, our Revit, our CAD, et cetera, et cetera. But really, we can do, do the right thing, continue to push that forward, but also we need to talk about the policies that are behind all the moves that are, that are hurting these individuals, hurting people who are marginalized, the people who are, you know, minorities, X, Y, Z, like that. That's something that we really need to start pushing towards more. Um, as architects, we can do a lot, but at the end of the day, the policies behind these these things that hurt our communities, um, we need to start, you know, attacking those, you know, advocating for those repeals, um, X, Y, Z. So it's 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 an important part of what our work is. As so, not just being architects and really how we impact those people, but also being a branching out to be advocates, but policy makers and impacting that policy. You know, you guys are too too young to have remembered the movie um, Do the Right Thing, Fight the Power, um, you know, and uh, you can't fight the power. You have to take the power because the power is fighting back right now. The power has decided that it does not like the changes that have been happening in society. It does not want to go back to or go forward to something that speaks about equity. And so the collaboration that you have with financial institutions and politics and the politicians and the people are what's going to make shape the change. And so you become a very important part of it. 
I mean, your pen has power, but if it doesn't have ink in it, no electricity behind it, then it's not going to move that concrete. It's not going to move those people. It's going to be just like prose. It's like writing a poem, which is wonderful. But, you know, think seriously about what you're saying in terms of how far you are willing to go with this and whether or not it becomes something that's more than just an application. And just to stay with this um, question for a second, because um, like Chelsea said, people are showing that they're fed up, but people have been fed up before. And it's like almost like a resurgence of almost like civil rights era type of movements going on. How do we make sure our conversations now don't die out in a year or two? Like, how do we keep the momentum going? What would y'all suggest? Cause I know Ralph, you mentioned um, making policy changes, which are like probably more lasting changes, but how would you say it more like at what we can do like professionally or within school? Well, I think one of the important things is all around the, the around the country, uh, NOMA nationally, NOMA, um, different, different chapters, you know, those components, they're really asking people to be accountable and creating programs to say, hey, here's, here are some things that, and this is not everything. This is, these are some starting points. You know, NOMA Atlanta has published 15 action items firms can take in order to move things forward. There's been diversity, uh, DEI challenges from, from Carol, you know, California to North Carolina. And there's also MOUs between, you know, M uh, you know, AIA and NOMA on different, and different, on different levels that really help to strengthen the mission of, of really getting the, the work done at the grassroots level. And that's where it really needs to, to, to start, uh, because the grassroots is how we get most people, most people motivated, but also know, in the know about how, how to move things forward. But holding them accountable on that local level and nationally and pushing that needle forward. Yes, that asks for a lot of work from us. Once again, I said, you know, we, we become advocates, um, of, of architecture and the communities we serve because of, you know, being black architects. So we immediately become advocates once we say we are architects. We become, once we become architects, we gain that mantle because there's so few, so few of us. And so having that grassroots level of motivation, collaboration, but also integration, so, you know, being on serving multiple boards, but also being at the table. I think, you know, a lot of people say, you know, find a seat at the table. And that's really important because that is what reminds people that, hey, we have a mission. Uh, and then if there's no other voice to say that we have that mission, unfortunately, you have to be that voice or fortunately you have that voice. So the question that I have is, are there enough of us at the table? I mean, we represent 2% as black people of the profession of architecture, women far less than that. And we're talking about trying to make 2% do something that is monumental. We're talking about a very, very few people realistically speaking, in this profession. And we're talking about losing young people because they either don't go beyond the four-year degree or they don't have a facility to take the four-year degree and go and get a master's degree or go back and get a one-year and, and get a professional degree. And so our numbers continue to stay level at a time when they should be soaring. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with whether or not you're able to practice. Do you have a job after school? Do you have a practice? Are you able to create a firm? Are you able to sustain that firm? Do you have hopes of ever becoming a partner in a firm? Do you have hopes of ever owning one of these firms? Those are the questions that you have to ask. And if you can't ask those questions in a positive manner, then basically we become irrelevant. We become poets. We write nice poems. We give nice, nice lectures. And every now and then we have a nice building. What's a drop in the bucket? You know, though, I'm glad you you mentioned that because I think there is a lot of pressure put being put on uh, Black women specifically um, to perform in certain ways and be the superhero, superhero, super powerful, which, I mean, we are, but I think the pressure that is placed on us to uh, to, to push the needle in certain ways, I think, is can be harmful uh, to us as a as a community within the architecture community. And it, it begs the question, who who all is doing the work right when it comes to accountability? How, are, are we the only ones who are really doing the work to see the change? Um, 
And I, I think it, that the answer to that question right now is no. Um, the support isn't always there. And I think, uh, that definitely is something that has to change. Um, but speaking a little, uh, slightly on a tangent, but I, when it comes to, uh, creating change or making space for change, I think something that is important that we don't talk about enough is doing the self work and not work that is shown outwardly. It's work within self to understand your why, your reasonings, um, what motivates you, why do you tick, um, what makes you tick. I think, uh, a lot of the issues that we see dealing with race and equity come from this, this really ingrained uh, misunderstanding of humanity and people. And that's not going to change if we as people don't work to understand how we should treat each other, uh, on a, on a personal level. How do you genuinely believe that you should treat one another or treat someone else who's different from you, um, whether or not they share the same beliefs. I think, you know, if we're, if we're expecting to read these books and just, you know, ponder and think on these good ideas and you don't believe it in your heart, it's, we're going to be running in circles and just wasting energy. Well, let's hope you don't run in a circle. Let's hope you run in a straight line or at least a convoluted line. I live with a woman who uh, started out in architecture uh, by chance and who was the first in a lot of things and who was tremendously inspirational for me and likewise me for her. And we've just devoted this to be a life's work. We're going to be in the way. We're going to bug Georgia Tech until it does the right thing, for example. When Georgia Tech starts to do business with its black architects, then we will leave them alone. Until that time, we're going to bug them because they really need to do more. We're going, to, we're going to mess with the people at the state house because when the Board of Regents starts to award contracts to black architects, then we'll leave them alone. Until that time, I'm going to be in their hair. And that's until these 70, I'm 73 years now, so I got another 20 years at least to bug people, to stay in the way, to be in good trouble, as John Lewis said. You know, but because once you sign on to this, it comes to life's work. All right. Thank y'all for that one. Um, so we're gonna move on to our next question. Um, how do you see, or how would you like to see architecture and architecture education shift to create spaces for theories, practice, and mod, mod, oh, modalities that exist outside the long held standards of the field? I already told Sherrod that I was like so ready for this question. Um, <laughs> I, feel as if currently there is no reason for someone who looks like us to think that they will succeed. We get to school and we're the only black face or we're only reading theories of white men, white women. Um, the theories that we do read or the things that we do learn about different cultures is to satisfy a quota. Um, for studio, we, we create refugee camps for these other minority, um, um, communities when there's so much more that you can do with these cultures, these ideas, these theories of minority communities, um, including blacks, Muslim architecture. Like there's just like, I can go for days about how there's so much more that we could be learning in arc history, arc history too, just all these classes that have so much leeway for us to learn about the world at large instead of just white America or Europe. And I really just want to see our world expanded um, because you, as black students, you have to look for mentors. You have to go to NOMAS. You have to, I was in Mitra's office every single day just trying to find a black face to look for. When I finally moved to Hinman and met Chelsea and Candace, they probably thought I never went to class because I would just sit there and be like, oh my God, there's another black woman who knows exactly what I'm going through or exactly what I, the fact that I'm learning things that are not, don't look like me or don't help me 
when I leave here. Um, and I think that architecture education has to get to the point where we're seeing black faces, seeing faces of dif different ethnicities and expanding our worldview. And that goes into why we're only 2%. Why would I wanna learn about this? I wouldn't because it's not my face. It doesn't cater to me. And the only way that we're going to get more diversity in these schools is if we're reaching younger black students. And a younger black student is not going to sign up for a program, whether that be a summer program, whether that be a couple weeks that you spend at Georgia Tech, where they're only learning about white faces in Europe, because that's just not something we care about. Um, so I feel like there's just a lot of change that needs to happen, um, whether that's quickly or it, it, it's going kind of slowly right now. Um, it just needs to happen in general. That's my spiel. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good day. I'm sure the picture here that was taken a couple of years ago when we were still able to touch each other. <laughs> a couple of you, and you mentioned one young lady who's not on the paper, she's on the call. It's only generational, guys. I mean, it is something, if you want to change it, change it, teach it. Grab the book. If you want to write about it, write it and push it. You have to take command of the situation. You have to sign out and find out where your piece of this is. Okay? You are pedagogy. You are the pedagogy, right? Tell the truth, just talk the truth and talk about what amazing works we've done down through history as people of African descent in the world of architecture and the built environment. That changes it immediately. That just immediately changes it. You know, you don't have to get caught up in your centricity. It's, it, it, you know, it's fine, but so what? It's just a cloak. I think for me, this question, goes back to who um, is being invited to practice architecture and how they're being invited. What ways are they being able to engage with architectural practice? Um, also questioning what is the standard? Um, who has set it? And does it have room to change and grow and, and metabolize in different ways? Um, and then furthermore, is the profession as a whole actually opening to consider these changes or these these different shifts um it's I, I think this is something that comes from inviting different voices and different ideas to the table so and hearing them listening them allowing them the space to be uh projected and uh considered I think intersection here is important as well when we start to consider the different ways that our experiences actually interact with one another. And unfortunately, in uh, specifically in academia, there, there have not been that many, at least from my experience, there haven't been that many opportunities to explore those intersections where they might occur. And uh, it's it's been made very clear that for me as a black woman, uh, the spaces in academia were not considerate of me and my experiences when they were made. And I think that um, for for architecture and architects to be able to consider uh, growing like we like to you know talk and dream about i think we have to make space for those those intersections and we have to make space for people to uh be able to share their experiences and and learn about their experiences learn about culture i think the absence of the humanities as well from my experience in in learning in school and architecture um was a missed opportunity. I think architecture is very much so about human natures. And if we're not understanding the different ways that that manifests in the world, then how are we appropriately doing what it is that we set out to do? Chime in. Well, so it's been almost 14 years since I was at Tech. Um, so, you know, to just kind of replay what Sydney mentioned, Bill as well as Chelsea, you know, this there's 
there are some changes that still need to happen. And when I was in tech 14 years ago, you know, there weren't that many faces, knew everyone by name, because um, there was only about three or four of us. So, and between undergrad and masters, you know, that number always stayed consistently low. And one thing that to point to Sydney's idea is that when you're in class, you, you know each other and seeing each other definitely does play a part. So that's why we have to make sure we, we, we go back to our middle schools and high schools and really show them and create a pipeline that's, that, that, that says, you know what, there is a path. Right now that path is a little rugged, um, but there is a path. And seeing us and seeing, seeing that it can be done is important for them to see that. Because honestly, you know, you know, as president of NOMA, I, I've been researching what, you know, the Bill Stanleys and I venues have been doing, and we stand on the, like the shoulders of, of giants. They have done some tremendous things. And I really want to say this to encourage you all that, yes, I know when I went through, things were not as progressive as it probably should have been. But you know what? We stand on the, on the, on the shoulders of giants, and we have to continue that work. It's not going to be, like I said, one, two-year thing. I really need to encourage all of you all on the call, as, as students, especially black, students of architecture, when you become an architect, and even before that, you there is a mission that is embedded in you. You have a mission um, of, whether you know it or not, of, of basically empowering the younger generation, but also reaching out and uplifting and helping those who are ahead of you so that they can get that work done as well. So that way when your time comes up and the mantle is passed to you, you can get that work done. Yes, it's definitely hard, but I know that you know, it seems as if the, the, the progress is slow moving, it's an iceberg, you know, and there's more problems underneath the surface than, than we probably can see. Um, but it, it's, it's really the idea that we need to create these pipelines. We need to be able to, to, to get into academia and romanticize African architecture, Indian architecture more, more, you know, diversity of Native American architecture really romanticizes the same way we romanticize, you know, Venice and anywhere else in France and, and European countries, as well as the architects themselves behind that. We need to be able to romanticize, you know, the works of Bill Stanley and the works of Sydney and Chelsea, just like we romanticize those of Le Corb, X, Y, Z. Like, we need to be able to do that. And academia is the place for that. So it's not always about this rigor of finite analysis of, we you know what? This is proportions, and this is the yes. We need to know that, but you know, there's more behind architecture and its impact. It's not always about the the rigor of technical expertise and you know proportions. It's also about the impact, and also about diversification and innovation in in diversity. So I think it's really important to to really you know add that to academia. Well, let's talk about who makes a decision about who. Um, has an opportunity to, to participate in academia. When you talk about 2%, let's talk about the numbers of Africans, people of African descent who actually teach architecture. I'm not talking about adjuncts who do pro practice, who actually teach. Maybe 37 people for the entire country in races of architecture, maybe 37, it's unheard of. I mean, it's, there are more people talking about shoe lasting than people of color talking about architecture, people of African descent. We just don't teach. We don't have an opportunity to teach. There are not places for us. Is that because of the faculty that doesn't want to have us there, because we don't have enough positions? I mean, is it just the president's fault? Is it the provost's fault? Whose fault is it? I mean, who's going to take responsibility for changing this? All of a sudden, and put Sydney in the classroom, put Chelsea in the classroom, put Ralph in the classroom, and say, I'm teaching this course because I know more about this course. I've done more research on this course and what, and of course what I'm teaching should be taught to everybody and not just professional practice. Who's gonna teach history course? Who's gonna get in and do it? I mean, you, you, you become a part of who you speak to and what, and what they say to you. And so the other part of that is you got to teach for 17 years, 17 years, loved it, okay? And so I mean, one of the things I think you have to do is really be willing to make that sacrifice. I mean, it's just a part of it. And then bring other people along because you have a tremendous influence on people when you engage with them on a day to day basis in many levels, in many places. And I, I, I think, um, Bill, you might have mentioned this early on, but what's crucial here as we're waiting to see the uh, 
the fruit of our labors is to not wait for permission to explore and understand certain things. Um, while we're taking this history class on ancient Roman uh, architecture, we also need to go and find our books about the ancient African architecture and do that history and do that research ourselves. Um, to, to fuel us, to help carry us through these moments where we are questioning, well, what about me? What about where I come from? What about what has got my people to this place? And I think, uh, to, I mean, that, that breeds itself or lends itself to, uh, curiosities that will get you through architectural practice that might lead you to getting your doctoral degree and, and, uh, creating these your own thoughts and, and exploring your own curiosities that w you can then pour into someone else who is just starting out their journey um so i'm really glad that you brought up this this point of, of teaching and you don't have to get go all the way to get your doctoral degree to to teach i think you can do that along the way as well um to this point of mentorship Thank you. I know you're going to ask the question. <laughs> no, that's a perfect response to the question. Thank y'all very much. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. All right. So what can we expect once we enter into the professional realm? Will there be disparity in the workplace? Will we make a good living? Will we make a difference in our community? I want to start that off. Expect the expected, expect the unexpected. See it and be it. Do what you want to do. Okay? Work for whomever you want to work. You want to work for somebody, stay with that company. You want to work for yourself, work for yourself. Don't let anybody put any limits on what you can do. Understand money. Understand business. Understand finance, whether you stay in a firm or not. You want to be wealthy, be wealthy. Make some good investments in time and in spirit and in things that will accrue to the bottom line for you. Associate yourself with people who make a difference in the built environment. General contractors, developers, planners, politicians, city officials. You know, there are a lot of people involved in the spectrum that have to do with what you, that, that have, I would say power, a tremendous influence over what you're trying to do as an architect. And God knows we've given up so much of our power, so much of our influence to other people and percentages of our fees. We've got to figure out how to claw back some of that. Don't be afraid to step out there. You know, plain dumb look. Buy a building somewhere that looks like hell, but in a good place. Eventually, the value of that building will rise to a certain level. Sell it. Make a lot of money. Right? Dumb luck. But keep your eyes open all the time, as far as I'm concerned, because things are changing and will change around you forever. And understand that you are not a part of just a design community. You're part of an entire community. You got to deal with old folks. You got to deal with young folks. You got to deal with babies. You got to deal with people in nursing homes. You got to deal with people in jail. You know, people in the church, people in the school, all around you. They all need what you can offer, and you need what they can offer back to you. So when you sign on to this, just know it's life's work. You know, and you're not going to be bad out there by yourself as the only woman in the, because, you know, they're going to you're going to find some some sister over there who's a film editor. She's going to know, my goodness, what you're doing is fantastic. Let's do a film about it. Let's make a movie about this. Let's do some sets. Don't be bridled. I mean, just do like the rappers do. Just take the bridles off and just run and see what happens. And you're at, a, you're at, a, at an age now where you can afford to do that. Until you have babies, cribs, and pampers, and, and and mortgages and other things, you know that that sort of tie you to a certain point. Even then, break up. Just keep it going. You can be whatever you want to be. Architecture and the dirt that goes along, and the hardware that goes along, that prepares you for all kinds of things to do, and should never be downtrodden about it. I mean, the world is your oyster. I think my response to this question might. Uh... I don't have a direct response, but more so encouraging um, 
whoever's listening to define success for yourself and really hold on to that. I think, um, you know, when you get out of school, you know, graduating is is an accomplishment. It means so much to have made it through whatever program you're in, um, whether it's architecture or another. But as soon as you graduate, everyone starts to contemplate and and, and stress about getting all of their hours completed and then getting their license. And so there's always going to be another step to take, another monster to face. And I think you have to understand what it is that you are looking for in your life, what it is that you want to do, what do you aspire to be, um, and allow yourself to define what that su- what success is for you. Um, otherwise, you'll be chasing after uh, dreams or ideas of success that and wholeness that don't resonate with you, and then you find you're questioning, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be an architect, but you're just, that's not true. You're just not looking at it in the right way or allowing yourself to think about it in a way that, that is, uh, kind to yourself. Um, so I think that's, that would be my advice. Absolutely. I think definitely just piggyback on that. You own your career. Uh, the second you, or even before you even graduate, you own your career. Make sure you, you're really branding yourself, marketing yourself, because you're your PR, your own PR person, marketing person, but also your own advocate. So when you, when you step out, um, and you're ready to, to get those internships, really architecture, it is a profession that requires a lot of work, regardless of that. When you add that layer of being a minority, specifically black, there's more, more more obstacles and, and elements um, beyond beyond just ar- the tough field of architecture. You know, you can overcome it and it can be done. So don't let that discourage you. But overall, there are more obstacles. But understand that things are going to start off slow. You have to absorb. There's there's take every single opportunity you can. Uh, you know, when I started with HOK, you know, basically 10 years ago, it's I knew that I wanted to absorb everything from everyone I could so that I can make myself. Chelsea talked about that self-improvement, like working on your in- the internal self. You know, I think that's important. I knew that I said, I want to absorb everything. I want to, I want to know everything everyone knows. I'm going to pick Chelsea's brain, Sydney's brain, Bill's brain, Shirah, everyone's brain that I can and absorb all that information. So that's what practicing architecture does and is. You constantly have to learn something every single day. If there's a day you haven't learned something, you probably have missed an opportunity for growth. So every single day you gotta be pulling something and stretching. Uh and it, it does it does get tiring, you know, take your get your work life balance on and you know, take your 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 weekends. Um but really know that you, you really have to advocate for yourself and you pa- you you path your own you create your own path there. And so that that's important and vital to know. So there are gonna be some tough times and you might not see individuals like you initially, but the work that you do, you know, impacts what everyone else sees and what everyone else's uh, perceptions. You know, optics are very important. Um, and so, really, when you're when you're building your your career, think about that branding, that marketing, uh, and really push that push a needle forward for for yourself. And your path is going to do that. You know, there there is a good living to be made in architecture. You know, understand that once you graduate, don't expect you know, the big bucks, but understand that it is definitely a possibility, especially if you create your own firm. Uh, once you become, if you, when you become principal, I'm not going to say if, when you become principal, you know, th- there's the opportunities that you can craft because the market is small. Think about it. We already said there's already 2% only. So the fact that there's only 2% overall, that means you can't spread it to every single firm. You can't spread it to every single location. There are going to be some disparities because our numbers are just that low. So understand that there is a there is a place for you to grow and to develop into that leader and specifically that black leader uh, to show and to be that icon of, wow, when I grow up, I want to be like, you know, I want to be like that person because you you are that person. Um, obviously, I can't speak too much to the workforce. Um, I only had a year out of school. Um, 
and I was making like $16 an hour and I was excited to be making $16 an hour when I had engineering friends who were already making like 30. But <laughs> I say that to say like, just some words of advice. One, take Jim Kramer, Jim Kramer's Making Money in Architecture class. It gave me the like basis of what I needed to make myself feel like, yes, I will make money in architecture. Yes, I can open my own firm. Yes, I will succeed in some way, shape or form because look at all these people who have succeeded before me. Um, I have three faces in front of me right now that have succeeded before me. Um, and then lastly, the imposter does not exist. It doesn't. You're, there is no imposter. If you walk into a room, you already belonged in that room. Um, and that's my little, yeah. I would say in, in the midst of all of this, be ready for the sacrifice. I know things are different now. You guys are used to having it immediately. But I can tell you that five months out of school, I bought my first house. I bought a house for $7,500 on an acre and a quarter of land that was built in 1850, and it was a shack, OK? Avinu and I have only had one new car in our lives, one new car. Because we're not new car people. We buy really nice use gently used cars okay for years i bought my clothes at the nearly new shop goodwill wonderful clothes neiman marcus they were altered to fit me i was in a, in a, in a meeting with a guy one day he said no oh, no it's a beautiful suit you have on there i said maybe your suit man you know <laughs> be ready for the sacrifice because all of that's the material stuff happens it flows through you and the people who will outsource you, move away from you, all your friends will be making all of this money and all of this debt, and you don't have to be there. But at some point in time, you will push forward and, and, and catch up with them and surpass them if money is your problem or if money is your issue. But when they start leaving their practices and leaving their businesses at 60, 65, because they're bored out of their minds, they can't do this anymore, and you're sewing along, just enjoying your life in the 70s and still doing great buildings, still doing architecture. You look back and say, well, you know, this is a life's nice work. It was fine. So each one of you has said the right thing. Just order your steps and temper your life and understand that there's something inside you that makes you do what you want to do. And oh, by the way, it's, it, money is relevant. I, I was making $2.50 an hour drafting. Okay, that's it. And I had made $5 an hour drafting when I was in high school, just out of high school at Western Electric. Why? Because I had a skill. And you, if you have a skill, you can always find a job with a skill. You can always find a job with a skill if you look hard for it. But you can always make a profession if you have a skill and a will. Um, I'd just like to ask a follow-up question based on some of the stuff that Bill and, and Chelsea and Ralph have been talking about. And you guys talked about um, uh, branding yourself, defining your career, doing what you want to do, um, don't, not letting anybody stop you. Um, what would you say to those people who are very committed to this, very committed especially to advocacy, and uh, but the powers that be, you know, the people above them are like, uh, are telling them to kind of tone down their language, you know? Don't be too aggressive about this, you know, trying to filter everything that comes out of them, you know, because we want to try to be um, very uh, forward about this, very outspoken, but people tell you to kind of use positive language, you know, uh, don't say it too loud, you know, just be patient and this will happen. What would you say to those people um, who somehow feel discouraged by those kinds of situations, you know? I would take out my buoy knife and say, I run this. Okay, I'm in charge of this. I do what I want to do. Don't you dare try to limit me in what I'm doing, ever. And the powers that be, the power keeps pushing back. It's going to push you back. It's going to stomp on you. It's going to create laws that suppress you. Don't worry about that. You, you're from the strongest people in the history of the face of the earth. Don't worry about that. You move past that. You'll surpass them, okay? Just know that you're not in this fight by yourself. I Stay in think, good trouble. Stay in good trouble. I, I think, I mean, Bill said it all. There's no room for tone policing in this kind of work that Black people have to do. 
uh, architecture or not, I think we have to learn uh, how to move through that discomfort because the support is definitely 100% not always going to be there. Um, and the truth of the matter is it that that kind of response is coming from intimidation and recognizing the strength that you are starting to channel within yourself. And I think um, I actually had a conversation with my sister who is um, in pursuing her uh, doctoral degree. So she's dealing with higher education, microaggressive behavior and activity, and has had people telling her these very same things. And it's it's something that is meant to cause you to stumble and to question yourself. And I think this is where that self-work becomes important, where you need to understand uh, that your voice does matter and your opinion does matter. It's valid. Your feelings are valid. and the, the responses like that are coming from discomfort being felt on the opposite end. And that's not for you to contend with. That's for, that's work that the other party has to do. Um, so keep that in mind when you when you face it and make sure that you uh, find find community to to support you when you do face those situations. Um, get it out. Uh, be explicit if you need to with those people and and allow them to nurture you and assure you that you are doing the work that you intend to do, especially if your heart is in it and and you recognize that it's a strength, an area of strength for you. Um, that community will be important in that way, but by all means, don't don't let it discourage you. I think there's a little bit of truth in the counter argument. And the reason I say that is, you know, people say, oh, don't say it this way, you know, make your, uh, decrease your tone, your volume and all that. That's not the part that's correct and that I, that I hang on to. I think what's really important is anything that you say and you do, um, just like any art form, the medium is important. I think if you just want to say something and to say something, go ahead and just say it. But if you want it to, to actually be received on, you know, to be received and actually impact change, um, being able to say it is just not enough. You really have to, I think, craft, and I'm not saying to reword your, your message, but craft your message so that way it, it is interpreted and heard and received so that impacts change. So I might say, I don't like black, the color black, you know, but instead of, if I, if I show you that, okay, it being red works very well, you might receive that better than just saying, hearing that. So, I, I don't say that you should be you should be hushed. You shouldn't be, you know, you know, um, forced to, to be quiet. The idea is if you really want to say something to do something to impact change, think about the the message you want to be received and crafting that medium. So that way that person that you wanted to and say, hey, the system doesn't work. Education at our tech does not work. If you want to say that, if you want to say, you know, the practice of architecture is 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 you know, has several disparities and you really want to craft that message so that the, the ears that they, that hear that really make, really make the change, craft the message for them specifically. Tell them, you know what, your bottom line is being impacted because you're not hiring minorities, you're not doing, you know, really craft the message so that way they understand what you're trying to say at the deepest, the deepest level that they can. You know, so yeah, you can start off by saying, Oh, this, this is, you know, this is not the way to go. You know, you can say, you know, you can use your, your language as need to, but really craft it after a while to say, this is, you know, use your strokes, like use your pen, use your voice, you know, artistically, poetically to do that. So that they really understand it. I think that's what I would, I would, I would add to it. I would say that be careful in crafting a message because there's a message and then there's a movement. You gotta be willing to back up what you say. You gotta be willing to stand in the gap and stand behind what you say and what you do. I personally did not respond to so many opportunities during Black Lives Matter and doing the conversations we're having, uh, both at the intellectual level, a spiritual level, emotional level, um, with a college of fellows as a child. Expect to hear something from me. No, not a word. I did 
My blood was too hot for me to say what was really on my mind. I did not need to destroy all the relationships that I had by coming out against some people who, for all intents and purposes, didn't know what they were talking about. And the responses were, so you sometimes you just have to chill, you know, and be ready to come back with another approach to what needs to happen. Um, the wise man does not always say what he says, what he needs to say. He does what he needs to say. And I think you need to be prepared to find that way by which you can make that message manifest as a real set of actions, something that's going to make a difference because there are terms and there are terms and there are terms. You know, and, and libraries are full of them. I, I think that that is important to know specifically related to the Black Lives, the response to the uprising of the Black Lives Matter movement last summer. Um, there was a lot of debate, people accusing other people of not doing enough work, not doing the right work. And I think that's that's where you have, again, you have to know yourself, you have to know your strengths. Where can you best serve the movement? How can you best serve the mu movement? And to Ralph's point, how can you best communicate it? knowing your strengths and your abilities. I might not need to be the person at the front of the protest line because I, that doesn't align with who I know myself to be, but you better believe I'm gonna be taking part of every opportunity I can when it comes to encouraging some black or, or brown student interested in, in design or uh, engineering or whatever because that's something that I know that I can I can pour into that I can pour into them in that way and that is still every bit as much a part of the movement um so I, I so I do really appreciate that caveat being brought up next question all right next question um Next question kind of touches touches back on what's um, something that's already been brought up before, but when we transition into the workforce, what should Black and minority students be prepared for in terms of advocacy for our and other communities? What is needed to be able to advocate within the workplace? So I think th this is something I, I think we we've we've just started to scratch the surface on. So right now the major topics have been um, the the field of architecture, the practice of architecture itself. So how do we increase the number of black brown architects in the profession itself? Yes, uh, and that's been the the narrative going around with all these major corporations, Microsoft, Google, you know X Y Z. That's and that's great. Uh, as much as it is about that. It's not about that for architecture for me. Uh, for me, what's important is that we as architects, and I'm including all architects, every architect, they impact millions, billions of people. There are more people impacted of my of of you know African American descent, Hispanic, Latino descent than it impacts us as architects. We really start thinking about and focusing on how do the other 98% of architects impact people and this is the back to that policy so all the rest of our architect our colleagues our you know collaborators they're 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 working on things that impact people more so negatively than 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 positively of minority communities how do we change that that's that's something that's really important to me because as much as it is about increasing the number of black architects in in a profession we also think about every single building that we design impacts how many thousand, how many millions of people? And if it's in the wrong way and it was, you know, we're creating gentrification, we're creating, we're pushing out people, creating tax hikes, we're like all that policy is impacted and the rest of 98% uh, are doing what? Just pushing that, that needle forward, even though they're saying, oh yeah, we're inclusive. You know, we have just equity diversity in house. Yes, but what about the pin on paper and how that's impacting people? Like that's, that's one of the great, for me, that's the next, the next, the next, the next uh, step for me on on working towards to get that better because we gotta have people who understand the communities, have people who understand that they're 
that the work that they're doing is negatively impacting communities. And that's, and that's major for me. Like that's billions of people, not just the, you know, unfortunately thousands of us. It's, it's billions we're talking about. That impacts were greater. Um, for starters, um, you don't necessarily have to hang out with architects. Um, I think the people that make a difference are not architects, actually, in many instances. The people who can be your advocates are the ones who are in corporations, who my friends at Coca-Cola, uh, my friends at Home Depot, my friends who are on the bench as lawyers, my friends who are politicians, my friends who uh, are community work activists and workers. I mean, those are the people who um, I'm in contact with because that is a collaborative effect. They want to know what I ha what I know and what I have to say about it. I don't necessarily need to lead that conversation, but I know one voice does really not make that much of a difference, but a collective voice of people who are like-minded, who understand the, 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 the sum total of what we're trying to do is what will ultimately make the difference. And so um, my good friends at AIA, my good friends at NOMA, we, we get along together. I'm fine. We're good. But, you know, I'm dealing with, with folks who are sitting on boards, corporations. I'm trying to get inside the heads of somebody who really, you know, has a big, big uh, check with behind him or her or somebody who has an influence at another level to try to talk about these things that will make a difference. Uh, the infrastructure guys, I mean, who is really doing this? I mean, you really have to gain the confidence of someone who is an insider, right? And sometimes you have to have somebody with you to gain the confidence of the insider, or at least to place the question in front of that person. What are you going to do about that? You're gonna run this road this way, you're gonna run that spring that way, you're gonna, gonna ruin this property that way. You know, what are you going to do? How do you want to do this? There's an alternative. And I think that 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 if once you get into the workforce, you'll find that uh, that that collaboration is extremely important. Uh, you can do a lot with two percent, two percent solution. Sherlock Holmes, you know, great cocaine, took him to another world. That's why it was so brilliant. You know, I mean, really have to have to pay attention to your points of leverage, your points of strength, and your points of infinity. And I think that. Um, at this day and in this day and age, trying to move from two percent to five percent is is a major, major step. I mean, that, that's going to that's going to mean that, for example, that uh, North Carolina A&T has to up up its game, get a bigger program, and start you know doing things in the state of North Carolina to bring people into architecture. Because we know at the end of the day that HBCUs, you know, educate forty seven percent of the architects anyway, and so once in the workforce, you got to have somebody to work with you. I mean. We know that what has happened recently with uh, with just the elections in this country, in in this state, have riveted throughout the entire country. That's why we got so much backlash going on. I mean, it's like really crazy. But the state houses are controlled by the Republicans, and they just decided, you know, this power game that you have, you can't win and we can't win, so we're going to stop here. We're at loggerheads, and so you have to outthink them, outvote them, outwork them until such time as people come to their senses and recognize there's enough for everybody. There's parity. There's a way to solve all of these problems. And it doesn't have to be solved the old and the, the traditional way. And we're gonna fight. Don't, don't be fooled, we're gonna fight. And that fight is, 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 is going to be everlasting for some people and some will die. But that's just the way it is, unfortunately. I think I kind of go a little off on a tangent, but also knowing that it goes into what Chelsea was saying of like that self work, um, knowing that uh, the studios that we're in in school are not preparing us for the work that most of us as black architects want and will do. Um, Candace talks about it in the comment section about the project typologies of our studios that Specifically, every single space that people experience was designed by our architect in every culture. It's not just art galleries, parametric high rises and community centers. And that's the reason the comment really stood out to me, because that's so true. We're building. These high rises, these stark tech projects in studio instead of projects that are actually going to be affecting our communities, um, teaching us how 
I think the closest we get to is if they still do the refugee um, pods in undergraduate studio of how our architecture is going to affect these people, their way of life, the fact that we have to research their way of life in order to inform our project. Um, that's the closest we get to. Well, I, I guess I should speak to myself for myself. I think that's the closest I got to to the architecture that I want to do in the real world. Uh, so just knowing that if that's what you want and what you're going for, that you have to do that extra work. Um, it sucks because we're already taking, you know, like 16 credit hours and on eboards and uh, trying to do networking events. But at the end of the day, that's the thing that's going to keep us going. And that's what's going to create the world that we're looking for. And yeah. Now, I, I hate to keep chiming in on this, but I know that 1968, a bunch of African American students went to the Association of Student Chapters of the American Institute of Architects convention in, our, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we pooled our resources and decided that we were going to elect the first black president, black student president of AIA students. And we did, because we were able to condition the Southern delegates, Georgia Tech, Auburn, places like that, that they really needed a change. And at the same time, we talked about the change in curriculum, how irrelevant the courses were that we were being taught. And it was a shockwave. How dare you come in and talk about this? I mean, we came back, came back and met with the dean, and they were like, oh, man, what, what are you talking about? Out of that, we got a couple of studios, a couple of design projects, a couple of professors got the, got the religion. Now, do the math. That was more than 50 years ago, and you still have the same issue. Until you are prepared, Take a studio yourself. Good example, Sam Mockby, okay? Auburn University, Rural Studio. Get out and do something about it. If you really feel strongly enough about what you're doing, get out and do something about it. Make it happen. You may sacrifice some time. You may sacrifice some money. You may sacrifice a, a great point. What are you willing to sacrifice? If you feel that strongly about the pedagogy that you're not, that you're being denied, then get out and change it. And just say, this is what we need to teach. And teach it as an elective, teach it as an open, open, open course for the entire school, if you need to get it out that way. But people will start to gravitate towards it, especially if you're doing it in the right, in the right manner, if you've done your research, you, you understand what you're talking about. And it's something that can be sustained. Because these, these cycles will come and go. People will, you know, the, the, the idiom of the day, the fashion of the day will always be taught. That's just the way it is in architecture. That's not the way you practice, but that's where you talk. I think in my experience, it's slightly different, namely because since being in professional practice, I have had a great fortune in being able to uh, work on projects that allow me to operate in a safe space um, to not have to always advocate for myself um, as a black person and I you know, that I know that does not happen often and I'm, I'm so grateful for it. Um, I looked at my uh, project resume the other day and all of the projects that I have worked on are black spaces and we the the architectural process that's been involved in them when it comes to you know starting up the project or or working through certain parts in the process uh taking into consideration community desires and needs um and and what the community is actually say, saying has been something that uh is being heavily talked about and discussed and even within just the the larger Perkins and Will firm, uh, there's research being done, efforts, people whose whose jobs is is solely to explore ways to better advocate for people who are not able to do so for themselves in the spaces that they occupy. Um, and I I don't know if it's going to distort my expectations moving forward as other opportunities come but i think it's been a blessing to be able to see 
coming out of the gate because it's it's possible. It's not perfect, and we're trying to fi- figure out the ways that we can, you know, progress and make things better. But I think um, what I have to contribute to the conversation is that it is possible. I, I was fortunate enough to have gone to uh, a couple of really good firms, Welton Beckett in New York. I learned how to do high-rise buildings, how to granite, how to how to how to detail granite and stone, how to render, how to deal with the design compendium of people, and John Portman and Associates. In addition, I learned hotels and, and office buildings and, and plazas and that kind of thing. I mean, just the mechanics of architecture sometimes, but everything to do necessarily with the spirit of the architecture, just the mechanics and understand how buildings go and how to design things. I mean, that's something that I think is 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 urgently needed. And I wouldn't give up that for anything because I knew what was going to happen in the world. Eventually, I was going to start practice. I was going to be dealing with projects on a much smaller scale. But the principles that I learned at the larger scale projects carried over. And so when I'm now working on larger scale projects, those principles still work. They still, they, 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 they're, they're, still, they're still solid. It's just part of building your skills bank. Your skills bank is such that it just says, I've got these things in my cash over here. I know how to do this. I know what I know the rain screens. I know exactly all those pieces I need to know. You know, I know how to make the building not leak. And so you have to you have to you have to be willing to take, you know, a little bit of salt with the sugar so that you can really get down under the mini architecture because at the end of the day, a great building that leaks is still like a, a not such a great building that leaks. You know? And so you've got to know how to do that stuff. You gotta I mean it's just it just dig down under it. The one thing I won't do is I won't do jails. I will not do a place of incarceration with African American males. I will not do one under this circumstance. I don't care how much money there is in it. But other than that, you know, I'm game for virtually you know, do much housing, my family, but you know, be willing to take advantage of all the opportunities that come here with because there's a there's a, there's a nugget of wisdom, there's a grain of of of, 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 of of great wisdom that comes with each one. There's something that you can learn, something that you put into your into your, your toolbox that you can call on later on that um that will help and so that's what I would impart in terms of the workforce. Every opportunity is a good opportunity. It may come from a person who is a bad person. I've had some really bad teachers. If I look past that, I look exactly at what this person was imparting, who was, you know, head of design at, at the Welton Beckham, David Beard was a scream at everybody, walk around in a sock beat all day long. He was wealthy, and you know, he could do that. He was from Yale, and he was expected to do that. But what he was doing, what the essence of his work was important in terms of moving my career forward. So I listened to that nonsense. Sometimes you got to put up with that BS in order to get to where you want to go. All right. Um, so thank you for all of that. Um, I want to take a few minutes to have um, have time for a Q&A. So um, if you have a question, um, please put it into the Q&A and let's see if we can get an answer. So I see we have one so far from James Kramer. Um, what can Georgia Tech do differently with resources and allocations not yet systemized into our academic culture? I would say that Georgia Tech can take better advantage of the laboratory that it is in, Atlanta, Georgia. I think there are things that are happening in this town, good and bad, and in the in metropolitan region that Georgia Tech is in a wonderful position to take advantage of, better than 90% of the other schools in this region. And I think, you know, getting outside ourselves and understanding what the impact that the school can have on the multiplicity of, 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 of problems that exist in this town and the ways in which these problems are solved economically and the, com- the community, just the, 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 the things are being built. I think you know tech could probably um, be the gold standard of how to operate in a in a very dynamic environment. Absolutely, yeah. You know, Georgia Tech is a platform on itself, and when you add that to Atlanta, you know there's so much history and richness of Atlanta, and then you put that plat- Georgia Tech in the platform of Georgia Tech being, you know, I don't remember if it's number one engineering school or. Uh, where it is now but you know that platform of Georgia Tech is really well respected you understand that the resources that you provide and the programs provided to 
to not just no mas, but the black community is important on that platform, you know, you know, nationally. I think that's one of the resources you can put, you can put your programming behind that. So, you know, I remember there used to be programs like Madhousers and whatnot that really had a pivotal, you know, pivotal change or impact on communities. You know, in that rural stu studio, as Bill was mentioning, you know, those programs like that, putting your, your dollars behind research uh, of disparities in Atlanta, you know, DTRI, I know, is, is, is huge, can, can have that. So the research you can do, put behind that, the programming, but also the studios you have. I, I mean, not to use um, studios as a way to get great ideas out, but those students have the opportunity to to flex their their brain muscles during studio to come up with creative ideas, especially um, during you know if you've got four years undergrad and then two years masters. All that time is important to to craft people who are um, socially sensitive to the environment of Atlanta and the issues going on there. You know, as Bill said, that is great. That's this is a great lab. There's so much history and richness here that creating a program that that is outreach that actually creates you know prototypes for affordable housing creates pro for like the mad housers all of that can be easily implemented into a studio and that really creates lasting change because it creates a prototype archetype of of what can be done and people expect that of Georgia Tech they really do if not Georgia Tech in Kennesaw with that kind of solid in sky. All right, um, we have another question. Um, they say, how can white people in firms advocate for black people, especially in change, in charge situations like a job setting or a job site or planning meeting? Um, did I say thank you for your conversation? I think it's important to uh to cons first of all this is kind of a loaded question <laughs> um i think being strong and brave enough to speak up when you when you recognize obvious ills that are happening is is key i think um and also just doing doing your part doing what you can to ensure that the workplace is a safe space for all people it doesn't uh your question is directly related to black people specifically so i think um you know trying to find ways to to learn what what those pressures that black people are facing in in the workspace in the workforce are um and uh taking taking the opportunity or taking charge and allowing yourself to uh challenge your own security where you sit in in your um in your whatever position it is that you're in i think um also a lot of times people just don't understand some of the challenges that black people face in in the workforce and i think um that just has to do with awareness and uh again just more education on some of the the struggles that uh we as a people have faced but i think um speaking up when you see things is probably the best way um i i think you do still have to be careful when doing that because you don't want to speak up on things that you don't know about i understand there's there's concern there but i think um if anything just doing your part to make sure that the spaces that you are working in you do your part to contribute to them being inclusive and uh safe for other people and i can't uh try to describe what that means for you to do directly um i think that's 
also kind of where the self-work comes in, where you have to, to work to try to understand certain things for yourself. But I think it, it comes with taking the initiative and also having the courage to do that. And understand that you might get it wrong sometimes. Uh, be okay sitting in that discomfort, own it, and then correct it. I think it's important not to necessarily look to advocate per se, um, but really create an open and, you know, uh, fair place. Uh, now, I think if you if you are someone who's older than uh, if you than the person in 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 uh, we're talking about, maybe you become a mentor in order to nav help them navigate through that. And I think it's important as students to make sure that you get multiple. I'm gonna side note here, sidebar that you get mentors on multiple levels at different places in their career because you can learn and absorb from every single individual. You know whether it's Bill's level, my level, Chelsea level, and Sydney once you get out, their level, your level. But, you know, think about mentors at different levels. So you can always help them so they can chart the path there. But back to the, the actual question, I don't think it's really about, you know, advocating for them. I think it's really about being fair and just and equitable in the, in the practice. So as Chelsea's saying, if something's wrong, you know, like us make an assessment of that situation is like, well, this doesn't work for, it hasn't happened to me that hasn't happened to you know the rest of my colleagues why is it happening to this individual why is it happening in this and really think about about why it's impacting that individual and do a self-assessment i think a lot of times is um you know people say they can't see their flaws and all that but really in reality yeah sometimes we can and so really do a self-assessment of what the situation and what you've gone through and see how that is different from an, another individual that looks differently from you and so you can speak on those issues, but I don't think you should look to be a savior of any sort. Really, it's about being being transparent and, and equitable, being fair. You know, that's really where 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 you really should sit and stand. And, and that's where I think is the right side of history uh, or where you, it'll impact change. You know, I mean, you and I had many mentors. Uh, uh, probably as many black mentors, white mentors as, as black mentors in our lives. Um, I mean, you probably more white mentors, men than uh, than blacks, because in in that environment, just more people who were willing to step in and and walk them out in in our shoes, and that meant that I needed to be able to go into your house, you needed to be able to go into my house, and get beyond the superficial. You want to be a mentor, understand what that person's going through, understand the history, okay, of that person's being. Uh, maybe even go to church. If you go to church, you do church. Um, and, 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 and then, you know, then, then, then the veil is broken. I mean, you can then, then see each other eye to eye. And once you can see somebody eye to eye, then you understand that, that you can be frank and honest with them and say, you know, the reason that you're not really doing what you can do in this profession or in this practice is because, you know, you go about it the wrong way. You overanalyze everything instead of getting into Oh, what, really? And once you've broken down the veil, then, then you can take that kind of constructive criticism and give it back. And it's a give and take kind of situation. So uh, if you really want to get a good friend, I mean, it's, you know, some of our friends, most of my mentor friends have died. They were they're, they're older men and they're, they're no longer with us. But I could count on them. I can call their wives now and tell them what I think, you know, and, and I was at their funerals and I spoke at it, that kind of thing. So, so you know, you get an honest report and you just know that that person is never going to stop being at their hearts a privileged white boy Republican. I mean, that's just who they are. But I can just tell them that, you know, this is, this is, this is as far as we go. I understand that you're in this camp. You understand, understand why I'm in this camp, okay? And understand why I do what I do. And if we want to break it down so that it's just architecture, then that's fine. So I have a lot of friends and classmates over the years who I know that I'm going to talk about 80% of the stuff that's out there because they have that awareness. The others, I can only talk about 40%. I can only talk about basketball, baseball, football, and maybe some architecture and maybe some investments. Beyond that, 
We're never going to see eye to eye. I'm not going to shut that person off from being a friend or an advocate for what I need. Just we're on different planes in terms of certain things, and I don't have time to try to teach you, and you don't have time to try to teach me. Right? And so meet people where they are. And I won't say use them for what they can do, but you know, take advantage of what a person can impart to you. It's, a, it's always a two-way situation. But over time, people grow towards each other and grow into a different person. And always, as a, as a metamorphosis in all of us. And so you'll be, you, you're a different person at, at 73 than you were at 23. That's what I would say. All right. Um, thank you all very much. I know we're a little bit over time. So I'm um, sorry we don't get to all the Q&A questions, but I have one last final question just to ask you all real quick. Uh, just to change the mood up a little bit. So what book, movie, or other creative piece has recently served as a source of inspiration to you or for you? So for me, I honestly, I have been doing a lot more reading than is in my my normal uh, way of being. But I think for me, um, I recently read Toni Morrison's The Origin of Others. And I think that book has been wonderful in, in exploring this idea of what other is, where does it come from, and how does it impact me and how I've moved through the world, how I understand it, because I think um, othering is something that we all do or have done in some way, shape, or form. And I think, especially as someone who is, you know, learning how to create environments and space for all people, I think that I, I, I don't take the task of really trying to understand and, and and dismantle this idea of othering lightly. And I, uh, I mean, of course, Toni Morrison, the way she uses her words, they, they, it's just, you know, incredible. So um, if you have the time, it's a short read book is about this thick, so you definitely can find the time. I would highly encourage that one. Okay. The book I always go back to, I uh, keep it next to me, it's as close as a Bible. The Ways of White Folks, I mean, it's huge. It's a signed copy. It was a short stories. A person who's trying to birth a book himself, see, um, it's very inspiration to, to hear what he thinks about situations that were old but new, things that never change from the 30s to the 20s, um, you know, and, and that's, 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 that's an important book for me. If you get a chance to get it, The Ways of White Folks is a wonderful series of short stories that puts things into perspective. It, it frames today and what is happening today from the, from the, from the vantage point of, 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 of situations that happened a long time ago. Well, I'm gonna be a little bit of a nerd, but uh one of one book I really do like is uh I recommend is is, is The Alchemist. And if you strip away all the other um, you know, supernatural items from it, you know, it really talks about that that personal legend. And I think it's been an an, an overarching, you know, kind of uh, message th throughout this this panel actually of your personal your personal um journey and you know you having that personal um connection to yourself but also knowing what you're 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 slated for you know sometimes it's far it's hard to see what that is but you know the, in the alchemist you know this guy's on this journey you know the practice of architecture is this journey uh same way of how we're trying to get to that that moment or that point where you know um of of finding that true self that true form and so the entire you know pursuit of architecture in our practice but also our you know new mantle of being advocates you know for you know ourselves but also for our profession and our communities is always this you know continual growth and you know there's a quote about or there's a point where it's like if you want something so hard the universe will conspire to make it work for you like everything will align you know like 
it seems to take time for some things to align in terms of our discussion right now. But when you want something and your will is so strong, you know, the the parties and the people will like you, you will find the masses, you'll find the people to collaborate with. Like Bill was saying, like you'll find that, you know, the people in the financial and business sector that align with you to, to make that will, you know, become reality. So, you know, I think it's a really great book and great read if you haven't read it. Uh, so I'm more of a TV watcher than I am a book reader. Um, so I guess I defer from the other three panelists. Uh, I fully believe, as they say, if you get over that one inch barrier that we call subtitles, that your entire world is just opened. Um, so I have been watching this show. It is called Wonder Egg Priority. I know, weird title, but it is a psychological drama that focuses on the childhood, they call it the childhood phenomenon of um, uh, young girls who takes, uh, who commit suicide. And while that does sound like a very harsh topic that wouldn't lighten the mood like Sherrod wanted to, the premise of it is being a good person. Like you have no idea what anybody else is going through. You have no idea what's going through somebody else's mind. You saying one thing to somebody, even a stranger, a smile on the street changes their day, um, can change their outlook on how their day is going. Um, befriending that one person in class that kind of stays to themselves, that changes their entire high school, middle school, college career. So that is kind of what keeps me going because as we talk about, life is just about being a good person. Um, with the same question of how do you advocate, be a good person, do your self-work, as Chelsea has said multiple times, and just know that you may be going through something, but so is everybody else. And we're all on this planet for a good time and not a long time. So just be there for each other and be a good person. And I'll leave you with one bit of uh, advice, and that is start your day out with prayer. Uh, we have a prayer call every, every morning at 6 a.m., Monday through Saturday, except on Sundays. Get your exercise in, fresh air, take a nice walk, get a decent breakfast, put on your best face and your best attire every day. Look sharp, be sharp, and move your day according to some order. You do that. Oh, and of course, make up your bed uh, and clean up around you. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, but if you do that, there's a certain synergy that comes as, as a result of that accomplishment early in, early on in the day, and it carries you through the rest of the day. Probably heard this already, but that's what we do. All right, all right. Thank you all very much for um, coming. So thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Bill, for joining us today. Thank you for this discussion. Um, thank you for everything you talked about. Um, very deep, a lot of things we got to digest, take some time to think about ourselves, I feel. Um, I also want to say thank you to Mitra. Um, she was working in the background, helping put the, all this together. Thank you to Carmen, thank you to the school, thank you to my other NOMAS members. Um, thank you for everyone that um, attended this call to ask their questions, um, just for being a part of this. Um, so yeah, thank you all very much for coming out. And that is our event. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, thanks so Thank much, you. guys. Stay well, everybody. Bye. We'll hug again one day. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs>